well, welcome to everybody. I uh, appreciate your being here at this. I know we're all busy these days, and we've got lots of choices of what we can do with our time, and I appreciate you uh, spending your time with this this morning, and I hope you find it worthwhile. Sort of set the stage. Um, this is a map of our state that shows the distribution of the wells that we have in Colorado, and you can see there at the top we've got a little over 100,000 uh, total wells now in the database for the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and the Colorado Geological Survey. And of those, a uh, little under half are actually producing. Uh, you may remember in the old days it was possible to drill a dry hole. Uh, these days uh, it seems like it's tougher and tougher to drill a dry hole. Uh, let's go back and start at the beginning because that's really where um, fracturing begins. 1859, Colonel Drake drilled down about 69 feet and discovered oil that flowed to the surface. And obviously, once that happened, a lot of people wanted to get in on that. So people began drilling wells all around where Colonel Drake was occurring. But not all of those wells were able to flow oil to the surface. Some of them didn't flow oil at all. Some flowed it very poorly compared to Colonel Drake's well. And so people got the idea, what if we could set off some dynamite down there? Maybe that would get the oil flowing. And so the next year, in 1860, there were actually five of these dynamite explosions set off down the hole. And some of those explosions um, caused the flow to get up the, near uh, Colonel Drake's uh, well, even though they hadn't flowed initially. Uh, but others did not work well. So there were some, uh, some, some successes and some failures of this uh, pretty uncontrolled method for fracturing the rocks down below. During the next five years, the Civil War sort of cut back on, on uh, drilling uh, because people were involved in the war effort, but there were a total of 30 dynamite fracks tried in 1865, and just like those first five, uh, some worked and some didn't. In, uh, the, the idea was to explode the rock down there and break it up so that oil could move out better, and it also had an advantage of cleaning out the borehole in case there was paraffin or something that was clogging up the, the borehole. In 1865, they came up with a new method as opposed to the uh, dynamite approach, and that was to use nitroglycerin as a way of breaking up the rock down there and cleaning out the well bore. So in 1866, there was a, um, a the first patent issued on the nitroglycerin process, and it involved a long tube that was called a torpedo, and they would pour the nitroglycerin into this torpedo and lower it down the well. Um, this is a little cross-section from 1866 in the patent application. Um, you can see the torpedo located here that would be filled with nitroglycerin, which was lowered on the cable. And then there was a, a heavy weight that had a hollow center that could slide down the cable. And this was dropped down and would explode a percussion cup on the top of the uh, nitroglycerin torpedo, which would blow and explode. And that became a big business uh, throughout much of the country during this period of time. Uh, this is uh, the nitro wagon back in the old days that would carry these uh, tubes um, that could be uh, even preloaded with uh, nitroglycerin. And of course, driving the nitro wagon probably was a better paying job, but you better spend the money fast because there were lots of accidental explosions. But this is what one of the downhole explosions looks like at the surface. And you can see how it's blowing and kind of cleaning out the well bore as well as breaking up the rock down below. So um, another larger tr nitro truck in the 1870s. And then, or nitro wagon, then uh, with the automobile there became motorized nitro trucks, and you can see there were big danger signs on them. This is one standing behind a barrier as the explosion's going off in the well behind that barrier that you can see all of the debris coming out of the hole. Uh, up into the 1920s, still being used, and still occasionally having explosions that would kill people and uh, destroy property. Uh, one of the more modern 
uh, torpedo trucks. Uh, and this went up into the 1940s. And then in 1941, there was a huge explosion of a nitro truck that was on the way to the well. Um, this car right here was blown about 30 yards. It happened to be driving down the road. It had just passed it and was in front of it. The truck itself is essentially vaporized along with the, the driver. And the industry and the public, I think, looked at this and said, there's got to be a better way. This is just simply too dangerous to have these nitro trucks driving on the highways um, in, in a lot of different places. And so the industry began to look at what are other ways that we could accomplish the same purpose in a well uh, as the nitro explosions. And so in March 1947, the very first hydraulic fracturing occurred near Duncan, Oklahoma. And this new process had several advantages over the nitroglycerin fracturing. First of all, it eliminated the explosive risk that uh, was so uh, prevalent in so many different areas of the country. And the other thing is that when the nitroglycerin went off, it just sort of shattered in a random, there really wasn't a way to, to direct where it's going to do it. You certainly put it at the depth in the well where you wanted the explosion to occur, but it was a relatively uncontrolled uh, way to fracture the rocks down there. So this new hydraulic fracturing, you could actually pump the water in uh, much more accurately to the target. And of course, today we can do it even far more accurately than it was in that very first experiment. The other advantage is that when you break the rocks down there um, and you open up fractures, the weight of the overlying rock can close those fractures back up. And so by pumping this water or fluid in, you can actually carry some kind of prop in that will be carried back into those cracks and then can keep it open. So if we look at this uh, little diagram of what the sand grains might look down, like down there that have the oil in them, you create these little fractures and you create thousands of these little fractures through uh, the sand particles that can carry water or carry oil or carry natural gas more efficiently than what the natural pore spaces between the grains can do. So you pump in this water and you pump it in at a pressure high enough to uh, actually fracture the rock. And then you want to be sure that those fractures stay open. And so you pump in uh, little particles that will keep those cracks open so that the gas and oil uh, that you're trying to retrieve can continue to flow for a long period of time. And uh, normally they, they use um, a, a very pure uh, sand to, do, to be the propagant, but in some instances they actually use ceramic balls or other kinds of uh, synthetic balls that uh, have been manufactured specifically for this process. In the process of fracturing, the first thing that you do is you run casing through the formation that's got the gas or oil that you've drilled into, and you cement that casing in. And then you go in with what's called a perforating gun. And that gun shoots off, actually, little charges that go, are strong enough to go through the steel and to go through the cement and go out into the rocks so that material can flow in. Now, when you have really good rock that you don't have to fracture, then once you've done this, the oil can just flow in and you don't have to do any fracturing or anything. But most of those good sandstones and limestones in the United States have long since been drilled and there aren't many of those left. So many of the rocks uh, need hydraulic fracturing in order to do it. But you, you shoot this perforation through the steel and cement and into the rock. And so you go up and do as many holes as you want. And then you bring that tool out of the hole. And you go back in with the tool to, be, to put the fluid and the sand down into the formation. So it's pumped down under high enough pressure to go out through those perfor perforations and then reach out beyond and force its way out into the rock and prop it open. And then the sand, if all goes well, stays in the cracks and keeps it open. And uh, after you've fractured the zones that you want to fracture, you get flow back into the well that flows up to the surface. 
and that's a combination of gas, oil, and uh, or gas if it's natural gas, oil if it's oil, maybe a combination of both. The fluid that went back in there, and some of the sand comes back out. So when you do the fracturing operation, this is an idealized look at what the surface setup is. You have tanks that have the fluid that's going to carry the um, the sand down into the to the well bore. Um, you have sand stored there. Uh, some of the massive fracks, I can remember the the mind-blowing sort of numbers in the late 70s when they were doing just beginning these massive fracks in the Denver Basin. 17 boxcar loads of sand pumped down one well. And then there are chemicals that will be mixed in with the, um, with the water to go down into the well to carry it. And so to mix all of this stuff together, you have trucks that are specialized for blending all of this in exactly the right proportion to hopefully uh, do the most successful frack job. And then there are a number of pump trucks there to get that pressure up to be able to push it down and to go out into the formation and to fracture the rocks. And of course then there's the truck that's the brains of all of it that keeps it all coordinated and all of this has got to happen you know, kind of constantly. You don't want to get started and have something go wrong and have to shut down in the middle of it because uh, you may have to start the whole process over and bring in new supplies. So after you've created these fractures out into the rock and hopefully got the sand out there to keep it open, then you have this period of what's called flowback when all of this stuff comes back out of the fractures and uh, up into the well bore. And this is kind of a period called clean out before you're having just your pure natural gas or your pure um, sand. Uh, oil come flowing out of the well. And it's interesting that the oil and gas fracturing that's going out in and on in the states that have uh, oil and gas that's uh, amenable to production by natural fracturing is reaching out far beyond those states. For instance, this is a sand quarry in Iowa whose only purpose is to be used as frac sand. Now, Iowa has a little bit of production, but most of this stuff's going out of state. Um, in my wife's home state of, of Wisconsin, they don't have any oil and gas production, but they have a huge impact from fracking because there are quarries for this wonderful sand that they have opening up all over her county. And of course, that's beginning to have people say, wait a minute, you know, do we want to turn the whole county into a quarry or not? But it's shipped to the states where it's being used. Um, as this material gets back to the surface, um, it's got to be disposed of properly. And one of the first things can be putting it in a lined pit where it can then later be pumped out and transported to uh, a safe disposal site. We'll talk a little bit more about how this fluid is, is uh, disposed of. So there are a lot of oil and, nat and natural gas operations that produce water and always have. And the zones in which um, oil and gas are produced, the deeper you go in the earth, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about in a minute is we want to be sure that the fresh water aquifers are not contaminated by any processes associated with oil and gas drilling. Um, but the deeper you go in the earth, the saltier the water becomes. So only near the surface do we have really fresh water, but most of the water down where oil and gas is produced is salt water. And so you need to deal with that salt water when it comes to the surface because you produce it in a number of different ways during uh, different uh, times of production of oil and gas. So normally with there's virtually no oil or gas production, forget fracking for a moment, of, of any type that doesn't have some oil, uh, some water associated with it, and it's usually salt water. And then there are times that the percentage of water gets much, much higher. So to produce coal bed methane, one of the requirements for most coal bed methane fields is that you have to pump off all of the water that's in there. And so that water has to be disposed of according to the regulations that exist. 
and we'll talk a little bit about some of those ways that that's done in just a minute. Um, water flooding associated with oil fields, that's a secondary recovery process where water is pumped in and forces out some of the remaining oil. That can produce a lot of water. Uh, for instance, one field that I once operated in West Texas, 95% of the fluid that was produced was salt water. So you really have to deal with um, that water and dispose of it in a, in a good manner. And then the older wells become, it's very common for more and more water to come in. And that you can eventually get to where you're producing a lot of water with the oil wells, even if you don't have water flooding going on. Um, and then once you have hydrofractal well, um, that water that flows back has to be disposed of. And in Colorado, of all of the oil and gas waste fluids that are disposed of uh, and are strongly regulated, about 9% of that wastewater fluid is from hydraulic fracturing flowing back. So bringing that kind of water that's not fresh and is not pure usually, um, it's got to be disposed of properly. And, and one of the things is to put the water into the lined ponds like you saw and just let it naturally evaporate. And then you can dispose of the solids, any solids that have been precipitated out in a suitable landfill. Um, that's not a real common method, but there are places and circumstances, for instance, the Bureau of Reclamation in western Colorado was producing a lot of brine water that this is one of their main methods of um, disposing of that brine water. Other parts of it are pumped down in the ground. Um, if it meets the standards to be able to put into streams, then it can be put directly into the streams. And um, for instance, the coal bed methane production in Los Animas County, uh, there are huge volumes of water that are produced there, and most of it meets EPA qualities for going into streams, so it can be directly applied on the surface. But it has to be monitored to make sure that it's always meeting those standards when it goes in. So about 60% of the water that's produced there is disposed of at the surface. About 40% of it is injected in deeper wells. Um, Another way is that the water, when it initially comes out, may not meet water quality standards, but you could treat it so that it then could be put into streams or rivers. Um, I visited a, a site of coal bed methane in Alabama back in the late 80s, and they had just put in a $10 million water treatment plant to be able to put it into uh, a major river that flowed by the, the area there. And then the final way, or one of the major ways is to re-inject this water back into the ground in a class two underground injection control well. And so the EPA has really administers this program, although they delegate the permitting of these wells down to the state. So the class two wells deal with oil and gas uh, wastewater, and the COGCC has that delegated authority. And I remember back in the late 60s when I was in Alabama visiting an old field there and the guy who was running it said, you know, the state of Alabama has changed the regulations and they're going to make us inject this water into the ground now. And it's going to cost us a lot more money. And I said, well, well, what do you do with the salt water that comes up now? And he said, oh, we put it in the creek. So unfortunately, that's the legacy that we had. And we did recognize that this was not what we ought to be doing. And this underground injection well program began. And since that time, we've had, um, you can see, 145,000 of these wells all over the US. And we have 309 injection wells in Colorado at the present time. And any proposal to put waste away has to come through. All of it has to be, uh, you have to put your plan what pressure you're going to use, what's the, the uh, amount of water that's going to be put in, what's the purity of the water that's going to be put in. And this all has to be looked at, and it's looked by, at by at least two other agencies than C, other than COGCC that advises them. The Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation 
Commission asks the Colorado Geological Survey to look at each one of these proposed wells, whether there's a possibility that the injection of this water might induce earthquakes. So there, and then uh, it goes on to the, uh, the, the state engineer of, and the director of the Division of Water Resources to look at, are there any aquifers in this area that might be contaminated by this water going in? And they have very strict regulations. I've actually attended within the last year one where people wanted to inject water out in Mesa County and because of a concern where they could not show that what they were going to do um, would not contaminate groundwater, it wasn't approved by the state. But usually these are, are much deeper and they, they uh, uh, can be done safely without the possibility of contaminating groundwater. You remember the nitro and the dynamite? Well, I just wanted to show up this, this historic one because the idea of the plowshare program where they wanted to use nuclear weapons for peaceful purposes, one of those is that was the idea that if we could explode a nuclear uh, device underground, we could perhaps fracture the rock sufficiently that we could really get enhanced natural gas production. So in western Colorado, we had two of these explosions underground back in uh, the late 60s and early 70s. Um, that 40 kiloton test at Lewison was twice the size of the bomb that was dropped on Japan. So the, it didn't work. Um, it turned out that, yes, it rubbleized some zone, but the heat and the, the, the pressure actually fused the rock back together so that it was kind of a success, I mean, a, a, kind of a non-success in terms of uh, effectively breaking up the rock and and allowing gas to flow. But we do have those two legacies, and of course there are boundaries around that of a certain distance out from where that blast occurred that um, people are prohibited from drilling today uh, because of the possibility of uh, contamination, radioactive contamination. So let's look at how some of the, the modern day fracking is done, and this is a kind of a typical well out in the Pisance Basin where you have, and one of the things that's interesting about the Mesa Verde, which is the big producing formation out there to date, is that the layers of rock are not very continuous. In fact, they're fairly discontinuous. So, uh, but, but each of these little chips, they sort of talk about the potato chip um, type uh, structure of these sandstones, each of these little chips is filled with gas. So you'd like to be able to produce those, but your next well over may not uh, encounter the same chip. It may encounter a different one. When they first started hydrofracking these, um, they would frack a very large interval. And it wasn't always clear that the, that the frack fluid was actually going into the exact sandstones that you wanted it to go into. Um, or more of it might go into one of the chips than the others. And so, and, and you would go down and you'd frack a zone like this that would take several uh, of these little chips, and then you would have to come out of the hole, set the whole thing up again, go back in, and then do another large zone that may or may not effectively uh, fracture each one of those units, and then you'd go back in and do another one. This was extremely expensive because every time you would have to come out and start a new process, the expense just goes up tremendously. And it, the, the rocks out here really didn't become economic until they developed ways to go in one time and shoot very small directed zones and frack that sand, move up, frack this one, move up, frack this one, this one, this one, and do all of these on one trip in the hole. That's what made or helped to make um, that process in the Piance Basin with the Mesa Verde sandstones economic. And because of all these little chips, the drilling density um, over time evolved that you really, in order to, to get out all of the gas, and we don't know whether this is even the ultimate, but you had to have a well every 10 acres in order to do that. And of course, when they were drilling all vertical wells to do that, there was a pretty big impact on, this, on the landscape. 
and companies began drilling deviated wells from one pad. So today you're up to where you can drill about 32 deviated wells from one pad so that at the bottom you still have 10 acre spacing but you only have one pad at the surface. Um, so then those were tight gas sands, sands that didn't produce very well in the Piance and, and all of those Mesa Bird sands had to be hydrofracked in order to have commercial production. And then people began moving from tight gas sands to actually much more impermeable rocks in the form of shale. And the first revolution, um, well actually that wasn't the first, shale oil, and this is not oil shale, it's different than oil shale, which is neither oil nor shale, but shale oil, shale that contains actual oil in it, um, started back in the late 80s. I actually drilled a horizontal well, the first, one of the first ones for a major company that I worked for in 1987. And uh, we developed what's called the Austin Chalk, which is the equivalent of the Niobrara Formation here with horizontal drilling. But a combination of this new fracking technology where you could direct the fracturing to the specific zones you wanted and horizontal drilling. So when you drill a vertical well into a layer, let's say that gray layer is rich in oil and you drill through that, you're going to get this much of that rich oil uh, uh, exposed to the borehole that you drill into it. But if you drill in horizontally, you're going to get a much greater exposure from the same well into the oil bearing zone. And so if you compare this, and, and the longest well that we've got in Colorado that's been drilled horizontally is about a mile and three quarters long. Most of them are around a mile or, or a little less, um, but there has been this, this record sort of set. So you compare the amount of oil bearing rock that you expose to that open well bore, and you can see that the, why the horizontal drilling is a really important thing. But for horizontal drilling to work, you have to have a continuous layer. So horizontal drilling in the Mesa Bird and the Piance Basin would not work because in a very short distance, you would be out of that um, little potato chip-like layer of sandstone that uh, was a pocket of gas that could, in multiple stacks of those, be produced economically, but you just wouldn't have any idea once you went out of one of those little chips where the next one might be. So the way in which uh, this horizontal drilling occurs is that obviously um, we've got fresh water where um, people, uh, for instance Douglas County is completely dependent on groundwater so it's an extremely important issue with them, them not to have that groundwater contaminated. And so all wells that are drilled, whether they're vertical, whether they're horizontal, they all have requirements to protect that groundwater. And let's take a look a little bit at how that occurs. If we say this is our aquifer, and usually they're, they're much, much thicker than this, but for illustration, let's just say that this is our set of uh, aquifers that we're going to drill through. I've operated in a lot of different states um, in the United States. In every single regulatory agency that I've ever worked uh, with and, uh, and under, the most important design for your well is that it demonstrate that it's going to protect the groundwater. And that protection and the regulations governing that protection come about in two ways. So let's kind of look at, at how a well might be drilled. The first thing that's drilled is a hole that's a pretty large one. Uh, it can be two to two and a half feet in diameter. That's drilled to about 30 or 60 feet deep, kind of depending on what the soil conditions are there. And then steel casing is run into that, and that steel casing is then cemented back to the surface. And this conductor casing is what's used as the foundation for all of the rest of the operations of the well. And that conductor casing is what you set the blowout preventer on on top. So uh, it's very important to the operator that 
this be a, a really good solid foundation because they want that blowout preventer to be attached to something that is it's going to be meaningful and it's going to help. The next is to drill through the aquifers. And there are regulations by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission that as you drill through this, you cannot use a lot of the additives that you're going to use once you get down to the saltwater zones because we don't want those additives from the drilling fluid contaminating the aquifers. So essentially, the aquifer is drilled through with fresh water and pretty much fresh water only. And so once you're through the deepest aquifers that the state engineer's office has said, the deepest aquifers in this area at, are at such and such a date, and your well design that you submit to COGCC has to demonstrate that you're going to protect that, and they check to make sure that you are going below that deepest aquifer. Then you drill down through it with fresh water, and you run uh, what's called your surface casing through that to protect those zones for the rest of the well and the rest of the well's life. And you run casing through that, and then you pump cement down that casing, which comes up the outside of the casing between the metal and the rock. And that casing has to be tested to show that it is uh, a secure and complete seal between the metal and the aquifers. And that's done in a number of different ways. There are things called cement bond logs that are run in the well, and those have to be run. Uh, you also have pressures as you're pumping the cement that will tell you how well you're filling that, the volumes of cement that are put in versus the volume of that outside uh, space between the, the cement between the um, rock and the steel casing. So there are a number of checks to make sure that that cement job's good. And if it's not, then you have to go in and do remedial cementing, and you can actually perforate through that and then pump cement out to any zones that are shown that uh, are not uh, done as well as, as as they should be. And so then, once the aquifers are sealed off, then you get about the drilling of the well, and you drill down through those aquifers that are now protected by that steel and cement that is lining and keeps anything that comes up uh, inside the well bore there from getting out and contaminating the aquifers. And then, depending on how deep you go, then you may repeat this process over and over of running cement and drilling on down. Then you drill pretty much uh, like a standard vertical well until you get down near the zone that you want to go horizontal in. And about two to 300 feet above that zone, the drillers have the ability with all this wonderful modern technology that's all computer uh, monitored and controlled to turn that bit uh, such that it eventually gets to horizontal in a pretty tight turn, two or 300 feet uh, is a pretty tight turn for steel to go through. And then you drill out, and the process of drilling that horizontal well is that um, you drill with a motor-driven uh, bit, and the computer guides it and keeps it within the zone that it wants to be in all the time. And we'll see later on, that can get very tricky in areas where you've already drilled a bunch of vertical wells. One uh, well I heard about in the North Denver area actually had to thread its way through 17 existing wells. So then uh, you run casing in the well just as you do in a normal well, except that you're running it horizontally rather than uh, vertically. You do the same sort of perforating. A gun goes down there and perforates the zones that you want to uh, produce the oil out of. You then do your fracturing, you pump down, and you have, just like you do vertically, you can go in with one um, string of, of uh, things that can seal off different zones. And the maximum that I've heard is that 40 different zones perforated with one trip into the hole. So you pump your fluid down and out into the various zones that you want to fracture, and that goes back and then uh, you get the flow back back to the surface. 
So I thought that we actually, the Colorado Geological Survey actually has posted on their site uh, what's called an on online Niobrara calculation tool. And you can go in there in the Denver Basin and type in your address, or you could just cruise around on the map and pick a point that you want, and it will tell you if the Niobrara is going to be fracked under your house, how deep it is. And it's pretty much between seven to 9,000 feet deep throughout the Denver Basin, but people can find out exactly where they are. The second piece of information is that they can find out how thick the shale seal is over that Niobrara formation. And then it will also tell you how deep the deepest freshwater aquifer is under your house. And this has helped people to understand in the Denver Basin a little bit more about the process of fracking of the Niobrara formation. And really, in the Denver Basin, it's extremely fortunate that you have this very, very thick shale section above the Niobrara. It varies from about 7,000 to 4,000 feet, but throughout most of the basin, it averages about a mile thick. And I have never heard anyone suggest that fracturing here could actually reach up through that pure shale to even get to any of the aquifers up here so that it could provide a pathway for contamination. And most of the areas where fracturing is going on, you do have a thick sequence between where the horizontal fracturing is occurring and where the, the shallow water aquifers are. This is, just shows you the growth in the number of horizontal wells that have been uh, uh, done statewide. Uh, we're running at probably 25 to 30 per month. And you can see that the, um, it's dropping off at the very end. That's probably not real. It's more a uh, lag in reporting than it is, um, I think, than actual permits or actual starts not occurring because we've seen no real evidence that the pace of drilling uh, horizontal wells in the Niobrara slowed down. And this sort of shows you where they are around the state. The Denver Basin, of course, is the largest place where drilling is going on, and so far there are 400 and close to 450 wells that have been drilled in that. Uh, the San Wash Basin up in Route County and Moffat County uh, has had a total of nine so far. That's an area where a couple of companies, including Shell, are quite active. Uh, in North Park and Jackson County, there have been about 11 that have been drilled there. And then in the Piots, we've had uh, 31 uh, horizontal wells in the Niobrara drilled there. And it's interesting that in Mesa County, in just three years, the value of Niobrara horizontal production has gone from zero dollars to twenty million dollars in just a three-year period. Um, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission has a really wonderful website with a tremendous amount of information on the whole hydraulic fracturing uh, process and I've just pulled a few things off of their uh, particular page on hydraulic fracturing. They have um, a slide presentation on hydraulic fracturing that uh, you can run through on your own. Uh, this is one of the slides from that that shows the composition of the frac fluids um, and another slide from that same presentation that shows more about the composition of the frac fluid. Um, they have a frequently asked questions page specifically about hydraulic fracturing that they have the answers to from, from them up there. There was a, a movie called Gasland, and they um, said some things and filmed some things about Colorado oil and gas production and also about homeowners who are able to light methane in their sinks. And obviously, it's a very dramatic visual thing for a video. Um, there were some very, very misleading things and actually wrong things that were in that documentary. and so. The Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission uh, put together a document uh, explaining the errors of, uh, of that film. And uh, so you can go on if you've seen that and you get the full story or the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Um, there's a, a white paper on public health and environmental impacts of just uh, natural gas drilling. 
there was testimony that the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission gave in Washington to congressional committees. And uh, there were follow-up co commission from the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. And this is the response that COGCC gave to that uh, testimony to Congress. Um, it talks about diesel fuel in hydraulic fracturing in, a, in another document. Um, there was another document there, how well do you know your water well? Um, there also is a thing by the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, uh, Stronger, which is State Review of Oil and Gas and Natural Gas Environmental Regulations. And this is a panel that looks at the regulations that each state within the compact that belongs to the compact has and then makes recommendations of what things might be deficient, what things are strong. And so um, as a result of the, the questionnaire that uh, Stronger put out to Colorado, uh, the, you can see what the answers are that COGCC gave back. And then Stronger asked for some supplemental questions. And uh, you can read what the responses to those questions were. Um, there is a, a set uh, of, on one of their pages that you can have a link to that shows all of the regulations, and there are lots of them, that COGCC has for hydraulic fracturing within the state. And then uh, there's a site where people can disclose the fluids that they're using in, uh, in hydraulic fracturing. And uh, then there is a, a state review that was done of the, of the uh, hydraulic fracturing. Um, just a couple of statements. And a lot of people have looked at the potential for hydraulic fracturing contaminating aquifers. And in 2011, the administrator of the EPA uh, made several statements regarding um, the fact that there is no documented sample of contamination of groundwater from hydraulic fracturing process itself. And there is one area that the EPA looked at in Wyoming near the pavilion field where it looked like there might be a possibility that there was contamination from hydraulic fracturing. That has been looked at again, or is, is being looked at again, because the science of looking at that was really, uh, I guess the only polite way to say it was shoddy. And so um, there is a relook at that. And there is nothing conclusive yet to say that hydraulic fracturing did contaminate the groundwater. One of the things that is important to understand about that field is that rather than the hydraulic fracturing occurring thousands of feet below the freshwater aquifers, the hydraulic fracturing was occurring just a few hundred feet below the freshwater aquifers. And I think most people really look at that as um, not a particularly good thing to do. Um, so here are some risks that were uh, listed about on a, a poster of hydraulic fracturing and air emissions, methane associated with natural gas uh, extraction. And notice that there's nothing about hydraulic fraction, fracturing mentioned there. But methane escape is important. It is a far uh, more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 is. So we want to limit, uh, limit the amount of methane gas that can get into the air. And of course, companies want to do this too, because allowing methane to get up into the air means that you can't sell it and make money from it. So a lot of companies have begun to do better recovery methods of uh, methane gas from tanks and from operations. Uh, we've already talked about uh, contaminating um, aquifers but you saw the statement from the EPA. There is not any documentation after more than a million fracks in the United States that there is a documented example where hydraulic fracturing has actually contaminated uh, there. Uh, in terms of earthquakes, uh, the actual fracking process itself, there are two places 
that I'm aware of in the world. One of them is in Great Britain, and one of them is in Oklahoma, where the actual hydrofracking process itself may have triggered an earthquake. Other than those two examples of all of the million hydrofracks that have been done, um, there is no documentation nor claim that hydraulic fracturing could actually do it. And the scientists, both in academia and in the federal government, who have looked at this issue have all concluded that the process of hydraulic fracturing is probably not capable of generating earthquakes unless it's right next to a fault. So what are things, and, and as I listen to uh, people talk about these issues, um, it's interesting that truck traffic in your neighborhood I hear people complain about. I hear people complaining about that storage tanks for hydrocarbons are too close to schools and there ought to be bigger setbacks. I hear about people talking about toxic chemicals being spilled at the surface and noise from drilling operations bothering neighborhoods or light pollution at night where you have drill rigs nearby that uh, are there for maybe a year or more or, or smells from drilling operations or smells from storage tanks. Um, where are we going to get the water for fracturing? In Loveland, they sell it to the companies out of the fire hydrants. But when I talk to 350 folks out in uh, eastern El Paso County, they are all dependent on groundwater. And the farther you get from the mountain front, the cruddier the aquifers get. And they are talking about already when the country club waters the golf course, we can't take a shower at night. So they are very concerned that somebody might come in and drill for water and suck the aquifer dry or suck it down so much that their individual wells might be uh, damaged. And that, that's a very real concern for those folks out there. Um, another issue is what are we going to do with the wastewater uh, from oil and gas wells and um, the poisonous uh, aquifer contamination obviously we're all concerned about in any way. And then induced earthquakes are a problem. Split estate is always an issue with oil and gas operations around. Certain people don't own the mineral rights below them and uh, not very many people when they close on a house actually look to see do I have the mineral rights with this. Um, the odds are that you're probably not going to have those rights. And there is a movement to get rid of fossil fuels that gets into all of this mix that we'll talk a little bit about more. But to me, almost none of these actually are an issue with the hydraulic fracturing process itself. And I think from a public policy standpoint, and I've seen this over and over, that people who are concerned about one or more of these issues, they lump it all under the banner of ban fracking. And I think from a pol public policy standpoint, it's important to separate what are the issues that people are concerned about and how can we deal with mitigating those impacts. And I, I think the cry of ban fracking uh, has, and, and the movement to ban fracking by some uh, cities, uh, uh, particularly along the Front Range, has not really been fruitful toward trying to deal with impacts that really are real and affect the, their citizens. When you talk about banning fracking, in the United States, you mean ban oil and gas drilling because virtually no oil and gas drilling is done in this country or could be done in this country today without hydraulic fracturing because the good rocks that contain the oil and natural gas that flow on their own without hydraulic fracturing simply don't uh, uh, simply don't uh, exist today. I mean, they're just not here. Some of them are in Alaska, uh, but you've got to look long and hard to ever find them. And that's why the development of this shale gas has become so prolific, because the oil and gas companies don't have any of the good rocks anymore. They've got to go into these cruddier rocks that require all of this increased cost and increased technology in order to produce the gas. The Sierra Club it's interesting if you go to their website and you notice that they say beyond natural gas, um, 
that this is the title of their web page, uh, and I think that may lead to an idea of how they view it. Um, essentially, the Sierra Club was supporting natural gas a couple of years ago because um, they were hoping that they could, you, you could, that natural gas could displace coal-fired power plants, and there has been a lot of that displacement. Uh, by their count, about 127 uh, proposed coal-fired power plants have been taken off the drawing board since about 2007. But as natural gas, if we got more and more natural gas and the price went down, the natural gas availability and the price of it began to make renewable ener energy, things such as wind and solar, less economic. And so um, apparently they now feel that um, this is something that needs to be opposed is natural gas production. They've even come up with a new term, terminology that rather than this being a drill rig, it's now a hydraulic fracturing tower to try to tie everything into hydraulic fracturing. This is a statement that was passed out before the seminar. The Association of American State Geologists has representatives from all 49 of the 50 states. Uh, it's a very interesting and knowledgeable organization. These are the folks that are really on the ground, are concerned about groundwater, uh, groundwater supply, and groundwater quality. The Colorado Geological Survey here in Colorado has been working on groundwater quality, quality at least for three decades and is very concerned about these issues. The, the association a couple of years ago said we would like to put out a statement on hydraulic fracturing that would be fact-based. The president at that time, and there are some real diverse opinions within this organization, and were at that time about hydraulic fracturing. And the president said, okay, let's go ahead and put together a statement. But if there is any single state geologist who is uncomfortable with anything in this statement that we come up with, we're not going to issue. And it took about six months back and forth through email and all, and lots of wordsmithing. But this was a consensus document of some very, very knowledgeable people across the U.S. from both non-producing states and producing states, uh, people who have more groundwater charge and authority. Some state geo geological surveys actually regulate oil and gas, but there was a consensus statement from it. Just to sort of close. Let me close. just jump in real quick here. Let me just jump in sure. real quick, Vince, and mention that I did send that out last night to everyone who had registered at that time, but I think a few people registered since then. So if you registered um, uh, since last night and you, you didn't get a copy of that, just let me know and I'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks, Janet. Um, I just wanted to finish up by showing you uh, what has happened from the use of uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing in Colorado. You can see that our uh, annual crude oil production has reached a new high for the first time since 1960. And virtually all of that is a result of horizontal drilling and hydro the new hydraulic fracturing technology associated with it. The value of that oil production uh, is up to about $4 billion right now. Uh, from natural gas, you can see that we had a quarter of a century where we set new records each year. Again, all of this using hydraulic fracturing, not all being horizontally drilled, uh, but the horizontal drilling is coming in. You can see that in 2012, we had the first downturn in 26 years uh, for production of oil and gas, uh, for production of natural gas. And that's because the price was so low that companies really could not afford to drill these wells and use all that technology that's required uh, to bring it out. So we still had high production, but because we were not drilling uh, nearly as many new wells as we had been, uh, the production actually dropped off. And the value, you can see that the value dropped off far more than the production did from 2011 to 2012. And right now we're at about $4 billion for natural gas, which is about equivalent of what um, the, the revenue that's generated. Now these are just revenues generated from the sale of natural gas and oil. 
It doesn't take into account salaries or any of the other uh, motel rooms that are rented and all that sort of thing that uh, the total economy. A few years ago, the Colorado School of Mines had a study done to try and come up with what's the total economic benefit. And, they had a number like $23 billion. But you can see just the revenues alone, if you look at the 2008 numbers, uh, were about uh, $12 billion during that year, just from oil and gas. That, it's one of the major economic uh, sectors in Colorado's economy. So I'd be glad to deal with questions as, as much as I can here. Thanks so much, Dr. Matthews. We are at the 12 o'clock time frame, and so we had scheduled this for one hour. I don't believe the system will automatically shut us off, so we can maybe um, tack on another 10 minutes. I know some folks are going to have to jump off, but we are recording this, so if you want to come back later and watch this, you can catch the last bit. We do have quite a few questions. If you have some, uh, go ahead and, and submit them now. But we'll start with one. There were several folks that asked about water. And so um, the, one of the questions was just interested in how much water is actually used in the fracking process. Um, it varies by the length. Obviously, a longer hole that's 9,000 feet versus one that's 4,000 is going to have to use more uh, water, both for drilling and for the hydraulic fracturing. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I'd, I'd prefer not to answer that because I really don't have that that number. Okay. That I feel we'll try and get some more information. Yeah. About that. Let me, let me just mention one thing. Um, there has been a study in the state that has looked at the volume of water that would be need, needed for fracturing were there to be large-scale development in the Denver Basin and what percentage of the, of the groundwater that is available, uh, how would that compare? And they essentially felt that it would not be an issue was the okay. conclusion. Great. Thanks. Another question has to do with the um, earthquakes. And you mentioned that fracking has not been found to cause earthquakes except for two instances. But the question is related to after the fracking uh, goes on for several miles of the same formation, how will the formation respond during a naturally induced earthquake? Um, well, I'm not quite sure I understand that. But if, if the well would collapse, if that's the question, really the rocks are very, very solid throughout Colorado where we're drilling. And there probably would be very little response to any kind of earthquake um, uh, down in the ground. Um, there is the possibility of inducing earthquakes from the injection of water. And as I mentioned, COGCC has recognized that and asked the Colorado Geological Survey to look at every proposed uh, water waste well that they get an application for, which the Colorado Geological Survey has been doing for about 18 months. This question uh, kind of tags on to the last one. Does fracking compromise the ground strength long term? For example, 40 years from now, uh, many uh, millions of wells later, are there concerns about sinkholes and those types of things? I think not in Colorado. I'm not aware of any way that that these little holes could really affect the, I mean, they look like big things when we put the diagrams on, but when you really look at the scale, um, it's a very small part of the, the earth, and the earth is quite strong in Colorado, and I don't think that there's any opportunity for collapse or anything like that. Um, okay. And sinkholes in Colorado are very, fairly restricted to some areas. We, there's a map on the Colorado Geological Survey site that shows you where, where night natural sinkholes occur in the state. Great, thank you. Um, this next one might be a better question for the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, but I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. It was related to how many wells are there in the state of Colorado, which you already shared earlier in the presentation. And the follow-up question was how many regulators are there in Colorado, and how often are the wells inspected? And that is the better question for COGCC. I know that the legislature has recognized that because of all of this growth that the, they are understaffed and that they do need to add. And they have added a lot of FTE to the Oil and Gas Commission. And the question is, in whose view is that the right number or not? And COGCC could further address this during your forum. Yes, and um, I will mention that too in just a minute. I just got a, a message from somebody that uh, 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 org has a fact sheet on the amount of water used in the state. So if you're interested in that, just go to uh, org and, and you can find out more details about the water. 
And I will mention that some of the questions that we're not going to be able to get to are some that are more suited to be answered by um, you know, members of either the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission or the state DNR. We are having an energy and environment symposium on May 15th and 16th. It's right here on campus at Colorado Mesa University. It's a two-day event, and day one is really Energy 101, basically from the wellhead to the burner tip. Um, what's the process for the natural gas extraction? And it will include a hydraulic fracturing demonstration. So it might be interesting to folks who are participating on today's webinar. And then day two is all about the regulations that are already in existence on the federal and state level. So we'll have federal folks there as well as um, on the state side of things. We'll have Mike King, the head of DNR in Colorado. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll have Matt LaCour with the COGCC. And then Matt's counterpart in Utah, John Baza, who is the head of the Oil and Gas Commission in Utah. We'll also have a panel of folks from several other counties that will be sharing their perspectives of what the role of local government should be in regulating this. So that is happening May 15th and 16th. You can go to our website to register. And if you register before April 1st, you can save $150 off of the cost of registration. Um, so I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. There was a question in here that in California, some operators have fracked and full cementing of the well casing from surface to well toe. Is this practice better than those in Colorado? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. In California, they did what? It said some operators have fracked with full cementing of the well casing from surface to well toe. Uh, and is this practice better than those in Colorado? I'm not sure about what well toe means. Um, you know, the, the fracking that occurs in Colorado does occur through full cementing of the casing. I'm just not sure what the meaning by well code. Okay. We can hopefully some of these questions can also be answered at the conference. And I'll mention, too, we're setting aside an hour and a half a block of time on day two where we have speakers that are talking about regulations. And folks that attend can uh, reserve a 15-minute time slot with each of those, with one or more of them. Uh, to ask specific questions that might be more pertinent to your community. So you'll have lots of opportunities to get all your questions answered. I know we're almost at uh, 10 after 12. I'm going to ask them one more question, then we'll wrap it up. Um, are pressure tests conducted to the maximum frac pressure or to lesser pressures? Or to what pressures? To lesser pressures. I'm not sure. Totally well, understand that that's, that's one of the regulations that the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission looks at is what pressures are appropriate for what depth. And they will regulate what pressures you can frack under and what you should not go above. OK, great. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today. You've taken a very complex issue. We've gotten some comments from several folks already having taken this complex issue and putting it in terms that are easily understandable. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint to everyone who's registered. So if you miss any slides, you'll have all that. And we're recording it. Hope you have it up on the website in a couple of days for folks to watch later. So thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. Thanks to everyone uh, who participated. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon.